Hello and a warm welcome to EPTV. We're broadcasting live here on the YouTube channel uh, where you can actually subscribe to EPTV, Equine Productions TV, and enjoy some great content from the world of, of horses, whether it be racing, show jumping, other forms of equestrianism, and it's all completely free. And I'm delighted to welcome two absolute um, giants of the jumping game to join us for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. It's a warm welcome to Peter Scudamore and John Frankham. Hello, gents. Afternoon, Mike. Great to see you, Mike. How are you? Yeah, good, Franks and Scoo. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the, the, Mike, the... I'm a, Mike, I'm a long way from being a giants at the moment. A cardo <laughs> comes once a week and by... <laughs> It comes every Thursday, and by late on Tuesday, I've gone through my rations. I'm not good at that. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like in Kinross, Scoo? Fine. Thank goodness the um, sun is shining. Uh, we, you could eat your breakfast off this stable floor. Everything is so clean. We've sort of come to the nearly come to the end of any cleaning and anything you can do. It's it's funny that uh, when John and I were riding. That we used to have these breaks June, July anyway. And so without saying anything, you know, there's any positive side to this awful virus. For, for me, it's quite relaxing. The horses are all turned out. I'm not worried about what everybody else is doing. Having sons that are involved in racing as well, I'm always worrying about something. But uh, this, these few weeks, uh, racing-wise, uh, there's nothing to worry about. But obviously... The, the dreadful goings on. I've had a, a two acquaintances uh, have been uh, sadly no longer with us because of this terrible virus. So, um, you know, it, it does occasionally come home to hit you, but it, it is a relaxing time in, in another way. Yeah, Johnny, I mean, obviously you're down there as, uh, down at your farm in Lambourne and uh, you're, you're Clive Cox's, um, Clive, Clive Cox's landlord, John. Um, how how has he found it? Because he's got a lot of horses down there ready to go, isn't he? Yeah, he's got a, he's got a hundred horses in, um, and he's putting the two year olds through the stalls yesterday. Um, he's got the best lot of two year olds I've seen him um, with for quite a few years. He's got a fabulous looking horse here called Golden Horde, um, who had a good two year old campaign, but he's really made up into a nice. Um, type and he's in a box at the moment that Harry Angel and Lethal Force were in and Clive was saying he might have another July Cup winner. I said, well, it might be a July Cup winner, but it might be <coughs> August or September. I said, I suppose you could just about count it. But he's quite laid back about it. You know, there's there's nothing you can do until we get given the go ahead. Um, you just got to keep the horses ticking over and do enough with them that you keep their backs down. Um, but obviously not too much that by the time racing resumes, you've gone over the top. But it's just a question of sitting and waiting, really, and just keeping them um, just ticking over. Yeah. And obviously, as you mentioned earlier on, Skew, there was, you know, you get a break in the, in the winter in the old days for the, for the jumping and all that. And there's no jump racing out of July. But if they are going to resume behind um, closed doors, how do you think that will work? Is, is, I mean, there's all sorts of practical problems involved here. There's a big team working on it now. How do you see that unfolding, guys? Well, Liam Keneary rides out here every morning and he came in and said that they're on about having two weeks at Lingfield, two weeks at Newcastle, continuous racing on the all weather. Actually, there's nothing to stop them having 30 races a day. I mean, brilliant for you, Mike. You'd be up there commentating, you know, even if you weren't very good at it at the start of the day, you'd be brilliant by the end of it. Um, but he was saying that, you know, so they're going to have two weeks. You go there for your ride and you've got to stay there for two weeks. Well, it's ridiculous. You know, if you have one ride on the first day and then you haven't got another ride, you're away from your family. Um, there's a lot of problems that need uh, resolving before they think about getting that going ahead. Yeah, Skew, how, how do you see it from your point of view, particularly the fact, you know, you've got two sons, Tom obviously riding over the sticks and Michael training his son as well. Yeah, look, for, for as I've already alluded to, look, I, I, I'm not talking about the personal tragedies that, that just far more important than the racing that's going on, but from um, their point of view, uh, this isn't too bad at the moment, but I, I think the landscape of racing will have changed when we come back into racing. And there's going to be, as it is for the whole economy, there is going to be a period when it is, the longer we go on, the harder it is going to start 
kickstart the general economy and kickstart racing. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we can go on too much longer doing nothing, but I, I just do think there is going to be risks involved as soon as we go back, even if it's indoor, you know, enclosed. You know, there, there's going to be contact of some sort. It, it, it's just, you know, people have complained about Cheltenham. I don't know whether they should have raced or not at Cheltenham, but surely we can look at the, exper the experiment, if that's the right terminology of Cheltenham, and say, well, this is what happened when we raced with 125,000 people. So many people got the virus. I mean, that, there must be a way of taking that forward, saying if we race with, in front of closed doors, a percentage of us or somebody will get the virus because it's still going to be out there when we come back. Yeah. Skew, you, so, so, go on, I was friend. just going to say, Skew mentioned Cheltenham, which is the exception. You know, you get the Dan team meeting and a new market July course. But if you go bread and butter racing, go to Leicester on a Monday, it's like racing behind closed doors. Nobody goes anyway. So it ain't going to make that much difference. Well, that's what they say. That's what they say in France, Johnny, isn't it? They're going to resume there, I believe, next month. It's like, exactly. They always race by closed doors. So well, it certainly seems like that. I mean, the bottom line is what happens when a jockey gets injured and you're you've got already hearing about people that have had um, operations for cancer cancelled. Um, and then you get somebody that goes in with a broken leg. It's bad enough if you break your leg riding out. Um, but if you do it when you're out, you, you can't odds that. You've got to exercise the horses. But if you um, go racing, you take a couple of ambulances away um, straight away, a few doctors, medical people, and then you've got somebody who breaks a leg and then you go in and you need an operation. Now, that's fine when you can categorically say we can cope with it. But when... Um, you know, when these people are under pressure, then you, you just can't resume. So, John, are you, are you saying then that you don't think racing should be looking to resume behind closed doors? <laughs> not until we turn a corner in in the way we treat CV19. No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I think until the National Health Service say, do you know what? We could cope with another tragedy. My God, I don't know that, you know, if there was... Uh, well, there's not enough people traveling in an airplane at the moment, but, you know, if they had a, a multiple um, people to deal with, the, I, I don't think these hospitals will, would, would even begin to cope. And until you get the go ahead from them and they say, actually, we're coping with all the people that have got cancer, this, that and the other. Yeah. If somebody breaks a leg or they break a neck or does do whatever and we bring them in here and we can cope until they say definitely yes, I don't think we're in a position to go forward so do you think then skew i'll bring it up to you now do you think that the the negative impact that the publicity on 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 the Cheltenham festival means that racing is starting from off the, off the back foot at the moment then no I, I don't think so i mean everybody you know it's the modern world isn't it with social media it's so easy to comment Every, everybody seems to be so negative so i don't think yeah they made a decision we can't do anything about it they made a decision to race we raced I mean, so let's as I try to say, let's take the positive out of it, and 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 I completely agreeing with John. Let's let's look at what happened to Cheltenham. Let's look at the likelihood of taking up beds in ambulances, and let's make it. And when we can categorically say there is enough beds now in hospitals, and we can make a calculated risk about moving forward to racing, let's race. But uh, we can't. You know, when the we, we, we can't move forward as, as a society until the, there's enough beds to cope with a tragedy, a major tragedy, as, as John said. We'd love to hear from you out there. You, those of you watching right now, I can tell you that we're, we're actually broadcasting for the first time live on Facebook today on APTV. So welcome to our Facebook um, viewers as well. And uh, we welcome your questions to the to Skew and, and to Frank's. I think I might have a question here, actually. Um, well, no, I pressed the wrong I, button. Can I, can, I, can I just say, I think that this is a, it, I know it's a miserable time, but I think it's also an opportunity mm. for racing to set itself into a better position. Um, I think it's a long, you know, we're, we're in a place now um, where we could stop the tail wagging the dog. The bookmakers run they don't re run racing but they say when they want races um to be run the owners are the ones footing the bills at the moment now is a time to say 
for the BHA to say, this is the plan. We're going to do it for the benefit of the owners. Never mind about what time it is for the suits and the bookmakers. We're going to start off a new um, staff on a new foot, you know, and set this stall out um, in a way that they want to carry it forward. John, how, how would that affect prize money, though? Surely the, the most people, deals... like most people in racing, most owners, if you talk to Richard Farvey, he'll tell you 90 percent of his owners couldn't care what prize money is. Mm. All they want to do is go racing and have a winner. Having said that, though, there, there was a fellow quoted in the newspaper last week online on the Racing Post saying that the new £22 million pound to back up emergency fund for the BHA did nothing for owners. So there are some out there, John, that want their cake and eat it too, perhaps. Well, you know, listen, there's, there's plenty of different ways of contending. You, you know, you've all got the, got the media rights. This is boring for anybody listening. I'd rather be talking about one for Arthur and what he's doing <laughs> or talking about Golden Horde. Or Clive's got two really nice Mimas, um two-year-olds. Um, which look really um, decent. Um, but, you know, you've got a situation where the media rights um, get paid to the race courses, but they, they don't disclose how much they're getting. Why not? It's about time, that, you know, the, the, the whole balance of um, power has changed back into the um, hands of the owners. Yeah. Um, I see you getting bored. Come on, give us a no, question. Come question. On, give... Do you know what, John? It's me, me being so slow to pick up the technology. Uh, Paul Walbioff asks you guys, what um, changes have benefited jump racing since you were both riding? And who of the next generation of jockeys do you fear will be the Scudamores and Frankims of the future? So, come uh, on, um, Young John Joe looks an exceptional, exceptional talent. I, John... Um, is a magnificent judge. He, he helps one of my jockeys up here. We should be using John Moore to be coaching these jockeys. Anyway, that's another subject. Um, I feel but, sorry for Brian Hughes, Skew, do you? Because, you know, the end of the season wind up when you get crown champion jockey, yeah. that's all gone. Um, hopefully, yeah. he'll get and a little bit under the... Again. People say, well, if Richard Johnson had had the chance, might he have come back? I think, yes. I And it, look, he's the first champion jockey in the north since John Joe would he have been you know and it, it is a quite magnificent uh, achievement because the changes that the gentleman asked course for the changes I mean our day there wasn't the power of the owners as there is now uh, and it was probably that the power of the horses was probably spread out more the loyalty of the yards was greater you know you get the big jockeys now can ride for, for all the trainers when we were riding David Gandolfo had pulled Paul Bartner's first jockey, and then he had Mark Richards' his second jockey, and you didn't ring up for his rides. Now, it doesn't seem to be that loyalty. You used race. to ring up for everyone's rides, Hugh. I know, but sometimes <laughs> it'd be engaged. You were trying to get through. <laughs> but look, Fred had, you, you were first jockey, they had Ben Dahan, Jimmy Duggan, all those, but you know, there was a, it was a different scenario, and as I say, um, the Yorkshire trainers, when I first came in, which were much more powerful. Uh, now it tends to be uh, all centred in, in the big, powerful stables. Yeah, but, but, you know, everything's moved on. You know, you've got agents now. Um, Tony McCoy used to have a driver, a PA. Um, yeah, I agree. You know, the last year that I was riding, I don't know about you when you were at David Nicholson's, the last year I was riding at Fred Winters, I was still mucking out and riding out every day. I was no different to, you know, when I went there the first day. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you, you know, um, that, that we did that. Um, and, you know, I always, you know, the dis I always think the discipline, you know, especially of someone like Fred's and David Nicholson's, whether you agree with a lot of things that went on, um, the discipline of Fred's, for instance, was stood us in such good stead for the rest of our lives. You always called the head lad, head lad. You'd never call him Brian. You called... Fred Governor, everybody rode out in a collar and tie. Um, you can say it's a bit backwater, but I think it, you know, the, the Duke, for all his ups and downs, I think the discipline that he instilled in us gave us, uh, you know, you were never late. You always turn up on time, things like that. Stands you in good stead. Yeah, but I mean, Brian, Brian Delaney, who was Fred Winter's head lad, um, I remember I used to hate him with a passion when I first went there. And then, you know, we sort of started getting on. And now I look back and I just think what an amazing person he was. I mean, the number of, you know, the Nicky Hendersons and the 
um, Simon and Oliver Sherwood and all the people that went and learnt their trade under um, Brian Delaney. And he had a real balance between being strict, but also that sense of fun. It's a really skilled job and he was perfect at it. Guys, Chris from Devon says you both work for, for, for great trainers in Fred Winter and Martin Pipe, uh, both very different characters. He's asking, um, apart from their dedication to, to, to training winners, were there other similarities in their characters? Well, I, I, I rode um, for Martin Pipe when he only had three horses and uh, myself and Len Lungo used to go and ride out there and he was completely self-taught. Uh, you know, he was a moderate jockey, um, but an absolute genius when it came, came to trading horses. And if you... Um, want an example of how they differed i can remember saying to fred winter one day because i've been riding for martin a bit and i said look you know we're gonna have to start you know moving with the times a bit governor and you know you know the declarations be at 10 o'clock and at 10 to 10 you'd say what you're running tomorrow and he said i haven't made my mind up yet and i said to him i said i think it's about time we started having a bit more of a plan and he turned to his wife he said did you hear that darling johnny says we should have a plan We've never had a plan, and he never had a plan. It was a last minute thing. I mean, it was extraordinary. He was, com it was a complete natural and gifted at training, but there was no forward planning or, you know, I think we'll run this um, tomorrow and with a view to winning a handicap in two weeks' time, win 20 lengths, boy. Then, I mean, well, then we'll find another race for it. It was, it was wonderful, whereas Martin, was completely the other way but skew rode much more for martin um and of course i had quite a bit of time with fred and charlie brooks as well well i love the story you told me one day i think along the set, similar lines you said to fred don't you think that we should deliver plans in a ring ring the other trainers and find out um who we should be frightened of frightened of he said they're frightened of me i'm not frightened of anything <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah well martin yeah martin Changed the face of professionalism. You know, Fred did it, Dickinson did it, then Martin came along, and now Paul Nichols, etc. Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott have done it. But you know, Martin was like Sir Mark Prescott. I mean, they he when he went on holiday, he took the form book, he took the program book, he bought horses to, to win certain races. Um, and he would, you know, I tell the story a million million times he won the imperial cup and the coral cup with a horse and he said to me he said um this will win the coral cup and the imperial cup and you think well gosh just one would would do and i said well that's great well, what's the matter with it he said well i can't get into the handicap what shall i what it was so well handicapped that he had to run it at stratford and jonathan lauer had to win as far as he could to uh, to to, to get into the handicap of the Imperial Cup. So, you know, he was that far ahead. He was working months and months ahead and, and, and buying horses to win certain races. So, um, but, you know, everybody's caught up now. I mean, what's, what, you know, Willie Mullins is stable. When they come to Cheltenham, I mean, they're bigger than, the, the horse, it's bigger than most stables. And it's fantastic to watch, to see them all led round, the discipline. And I always think the happiness of the horses, the happiness and the pride in the, you see the staff walking around with those horses the, and they all know what to do. There's no shouting. There's just, you know, and you'll see Ruby Walsh out with them. It, it, it's a fantastic sight to see. Same as, same as Gordon's, you know. So the size of these stables, I mean, I think when, Fred was training, 90 horses was the most he had, wasn't it, John? Oh, he never had any close to 90. I don't think he ever had more than 50 skew. Yeah. You know, I mean, now, you know, they've got 150 horses. Um, you know, the likes of Mark Johnston and he's John Gosden, um, the two lads you mentioned, they'd run any business that you wanted to put them in and yeah. be successful. They're just, they're absolutely gifted at organisation. Yeah, Whereas I remember. I'm not. I haven't even organised my lunch yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have. You've got you've got a thumbs up. Remember Johnson White, who, who worked for or still works for Hobbsy. Um, uh, he says that I think ninety nine percent of owners will be delighted to get back into racing without quibbling over prize money until racing gets back on its feet. Yeah, so well, we you know, it's, it, I think it's right. People just want to see their horses run, um, and there'd be a few bubbles burst as always, but. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just hoping to get the show back on the road. But yeah. anyway, you know, let's, 
John, talk about things have changed. You know, you and I, if we were lucky to go on holiday, we went down to Devon or somewhere on holiday. We would stayed in that nice hotel in Devon or something when we were riding. That Johnson White, he's assistant trainer to Philip Hobbs. He went skiing to Norway in the middle of the winter. I mean, can you imagine us being able to afford to do that? It just shows you how things have changed, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As it went, we had two months off. You couldn't afford to go anywhere. No. Fred, Fred, Fred Winter and Dave Dick, when they were riding, Fred Winter, and that they used to go to the south of France and they used to water ski every day and they stayed there until they had no money and then they came home <laughs> and they started riding again. I mean, talk about, I mean, I said to him, I said, you're a rotten example of how to run your life. <laughs> uh, but, hey, Johnny, Dave from Cowbridge asks you, um, long time since we've read one of your thrillers, any plans for any more? How much the plotting was based on your career? I mean, have you... Have you definitely given up writing now? You wouldn't fancy a small comeback? No, do you know what? I I had you know, the, la the last month. I mean, for, for me, life hasn't changed a bit, Mike. I mean, you know, I love being at home. I've got loads to do. Um, you know, the horses are always breaking things. So there's, you know, I'm not um, short of things to do. But writing was always hard for me. It's all right for, you know, people that love it and... Um, you know, pe people, I mean, I cannot believe Alistair Down has never written, written a, a book of any description. He's the most gifted human being with words. I mean, I wouldn't be fit to fill his pen. And yet I've knocked out 20 thrillers and he's yet to put pen to paper with one. Mm. Um, no, I mean, the, the last month I should have been getting my head down and working on something. But, you know, I'm at the wrong end of my life now. I want to be doing things I'm enjoying, Mike. Yeah, well, I don't know. Do you know, my, go just on, to go Scoot. back, oh, sadly, go on, Scoot. The gentleman there is from Cowbridge, uh, and I listened to a thing today. Max Boyce did a poem today, and his use of the English language is is extraordinary. John, I couldn't be, I couldn't even write the the epilogue to a, to a book. So he's, you know, he, he his brilliance comes across on television and being able to to write a book. But to be have the be the wordsmith of, of, of a Max Boyce or a Alistair Down is to, to me is, is 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 quite amazing. It, it's it's a magnificent art. But you, but you're, you're not a bad writer yourself. I mean, you 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 know you've been penning a column for the Mail for, for donkey's years and. Don't tell anybody. It's not going out live. A chap called Marcus Town then writes all my stuff. <laughs> I, I, actually, the first I did something today for him, and the first day. I, he spelt my sister's name wrong, so I had to correct him over that. That's the first time in <laughs> 20 years working together. I had to correct I'm him. impressed. I'm, I'm impressed you knew how to spell her name. Well, I didn't until I saw it wrongly, and then I thought, I don't recognise that. Now, J John, you, 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 your father, Norman, is, is we hope, Church was still going strong. How's he doing now? He's in his 90s now. He lives on your farm. Is he in good shape? He's in, he's in great form. Um, he's... It, it was bad luck. My sister Jill, who lives in Ireland, um, her daughter, um, funny enough, they have a few horses for Willie Mullins. They had an old Duvan um, for a couple of months last year. They said he was the most wonderful character horse, absolutely, you know, lovely to deal with. Uh, but anyway, she came over for his birthday, which was on the 20th of March. And of course, they shut the um, all the travel down. So she's been stuck with him. And I don't know who's hating it the most. <laughs> having her there or not being able to get out. She's done nearly all my gardening for the last month. Been bringing anything to get out there. She's been literally, she's had the shovel and the pickaxe going and she's just happy being outdoors. But he's in great form. He's lucky. He's 93. Um, and I don't think any virus would get past him. And I mean, he's, <laughs> clean, clean, cleanliness is not one, one of his strong points. <laughs> Hey, I went to go down. I went to go down. This is two months ago. I went to go down there. For, I normally used to go down and watch Monday night football with him. So my sister was over. She said, "Sent me a text. Don't eat the peas." So I went down there and he'd cooked me steak and chips, and I didn't eat the peas. And when I saw her, I said, "What was wrong with the peas?" She said, "They've been in the deep freeze, out the deep freeze, in the fridge, on the stove for a couple of days." back in the deep freeze, back out in the fridge. She said they were white, these people. <laughs> and, when I, and when she left him, he said to her, 
he was trying to think what he could put in them to make them go green again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and he would he would definitely have eaten them. Well, he did eat them, but I certainly didn't. <laughs> yeah, it'll take a lot to bring him down, Frank. Yeah, that, nothing yeah. would bring him down. <laughs> hey, an email asks you guys, Skew, um, do you think Tiger Roll would have won his third Grand National? What are your thoughts? Uh, yes, I, I, really on reflection, he ran a magnificent race at Cheltenham. God, I can't think all the handicap ratings... But look, whether he would have done in Red Rum's day or not, I don't know. Um, but look, he is a quite magnificent horse. And, uh, you know, he, he would have been in the first three or four in the betting. The public would have got behind him. Um, it would have been good for the sport if he had have won. So, yes, I think he would have. He, he must have uh, gone very close. I'll tell you what is I did. Is Arthur going to go again? For, sorry, Johnny. Is Arthur going to go again to the National School? What are the plans for him? Eventually? Well, he'll have to be... Um, you know, he'll come back from his summer. He's got those uh, excellent veterans races to go for, and then we'll make a decision to see how he is. What were you going to say, John? Well, I was just going to say, um, when racing was off um, in the early days, everybody's looking at old films, you know, with the national coming up. Mick Fitzgerald phoned me up, and he said, I've just been in watch Chris' performance in the Grand National again. Oh, and he said it put a lump in my throat. An ama amazing performance. That gave £23 to Red uh -huh. Rum. Uh, uh -huh. He won a two-mile champion chase. And the lad who looked after him died last week, old Chipper Chape. He was, he was a big part of that horse's success. Um, but what, a, I mean, everybody slagged poor Richard Pittman off because he got tired in the closing stages. But he gave it a wonderful ride. I mean, Features. He jumped. It did, didn't even see the landing side. You know the drop. He jumped straight out the other side. He was an incredible horse. Yeah, there's a picture. Bob Champs actually, funny enough, this morning has put a picture of Chris jumping up, jumping beaches, and you know there's several things from that. You know, and I'm not saying we should go back to the old days, but bloody hell, I <laughs> it looked the angle of the fence. It looks enormous. And actually, my father who won the national in '59. I keep going out. On Oxo, and he's got a magnificent painting and of Oxo jumping up beaches. And the artist has taken all the other horses out, and he's just there by himself. And Crisp is so far in front jumping beaches the second time round that he's there. It, it, it looks like my father's painting in isolation. I mean, it, it, it's just a magnificent picture of a horse and rider jumping one of the most fearsome fences in the world in absolute. Uh, unity and yeah, good old. I, I agree with John. It, I don't think there's Pittman always blames himself, but I don't think there's much he could have done. I know the following Christmas there was a picture of Red Rum and Crisp on the injured jockey's fun Christmas card. Yeah, and I, and I drew a pair of blinkers on him and sent it to Fred for Christmas. <laughs> it's one of the few times he ever got really cross with me. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, I've you never seen a horse you know, put his life on the line like that. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. It was the greatest of all time, wasn't it? Without a shadow of a doubt. Hey, guys, before we go, we're going to wrap it so we can talk for, for ever, or I could anyway. It's great listening to the pair of you. And thanks for your time. I really, really appreciate it. What, what message would you like to give racing fans at the, during this tough time before we go, chaps? Well, I'd like to tell them to look out for the two Mimas Colts. I'm not sure what they're called, um, but Clive Cox has only got two, and they're both really good types. One's a chestnut, one's a bay. Um, so keep an eye out for those, and let's hope we're back on the course sooner rather than later. Yeah, stay loyal, everybody. Um, that's all I can say. Stay loyal to yourselves and stay loyal to the sport, and let's hope we're all back. Stay loyal yeah. to your trainer. That's what you're saying. Pay his bills. <laughs> that's the only. Please stay loyal. And my jockeys. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Great stuff, guys. Well, listen, most importantly, stay safe and well. And um, yeah, we, we, we will see you, we hope, again very, very soon. We really appreciate it. Great to what chat. Would James, Mike, what would James Bond have said about it? <laughs> Well, he'd be very shaken and very stirred right now. <laughs> Good <laughs> man. <laughs> Listen, great to see you guys. All the best. Give my, my love to, to Lucinda and to Anna as well, Johnny. And we'll speak to you again very, very soon, guys. Good luck. Well, Thank you.